Welcome to uh, the fourth seminar in our uh, year-long seminar series, Mellon Sawyer Seminar Series. Um, our theme for the, uh, for the seminar as a whole is democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences. Um, and we are approaching this topic from uh, many different uh, disciplines and in terms of the many different problems that are implicated in it. Um, including um, all kinds of foci on cultural minorities and uh, including um, Islamic and, and Jewish and others. And we are also discussing some of the political issues that come into play, which is our focus today. Um, besides recognition of uh, cultural minorities and what might be involved in that sort of concept, and. Uh, a key notion is that of toleration and tolerance um, and intolerance. And I feel it's a, an especially appropriate time, I'm sure you all agree, to be discussing uh, toleration in democracy. We've been exposed to uh, an intense uh, dose of intolerance, um, which we all sort of can see and, and acknowledge. But philosophically, the concept is, is interesting and interestingly difficult. And so uh, today we're going to have, as you know, um, a focus on that with our very distinguished speaker, whom I will introduce in a bit. Um, let me just take the occasion, first of all, to tell you how we will be proceeding and to give a few thank yous, and then I'll introduce our speakers, our speaker and our commentator. Um, our format is to have um, an address by our distinguished guest, Reiner Forst. Um, and that will be followed by a comment by Adam Atkinson. Uh, we will, so that's why you wanted it softer. Um, that, will, that will be followed with, by a short break in which you can gather your thoughts and get your questions ready. What we, the reason we wanted to start so early and go for quite a while is to give an opportunity for real discussion back and forth uh, with the speakers and among the um, the Mellon Fellows, uh, faculty and students who are here. Um, all of that will be followed by our renowned reception. Um, this is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Ethics and Politics, and we're known for our great wine and cheese receptions, which we have here, and it's even better than usual because it's a Mellon Sawyer seminar uh, one. So you should all be sure to come down with us to the fifth floor. It will be in the Globalization Seminar Room in 5109. So that's not to miss. Um, and let me now uh, t say, uh, just acknowledge a few of the um, people who've, um, with whom I've been working and who've contributed to this. My co-organizer, Ruth O'Brien, and also Richard Wolin, and Omar Dabur, who I think is um, not yet here, but he's planning to come. Uh, we have uh, great help from and a very interesting opportunities for dialogue with our postdoctoral fellow, Adam Edinson, who's here for the year. And in addition, we have a fantastic group of, well, as long as I'm talking, it's okay. We've got to fix it for him. Um, we have a great group of, No, you can't. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, to say thank you to our uh, group of uh, students, uh, graduate students. We have two RAs, Joshua Keaton and Flannery Amdahl, and they're both terrific. And our uh, super duper assistant and videographer, John McMahon, as well as a bunch of other students who help us uh, when they can, including Cameron Moshref and uh, some others who help with uh, reception and cleanup. But they're all. Uh, accomplished graduate students on the side besides helping us. Um, okay, and I would also like to thank Yakovish Vasiliu, who's here today, executive officer in philosophy, who was, has been extremely supportive of our program, and Joe Rollins and Polly Sai has also been uh, terrific in giving us help, as has the provost's office, and especially Louise Lenahan. So, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our distinguished speaker, and um, I think I will try to get both um, 
Well, I guess I should wait for Adams and just focus on Reiner Forst, who is known to um, many of you here as one of the foremost philosophers in Germany, which is saying quite a lot. Um, so he's professor of political theory and philosophy at Goethe University in Frankfurt and co-director of the Cluster of Excellence on the Formation of Normative Orders there. He's also a permanent fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Bad Homburg. He works on questions of practical reason and the foundation of morality, as well as on basic concepts of normative political theory, especially justice, toleration, and democracy, which are his themes today, which is great. His many publications include Contexts of Justice, uh, which was, uh, came out in English in 2002, and The Right to Justification, which has just come out from Columbia. And also, we're very excited about Toleration and Conflict, which is about due out in a few weeks from Cambridge University Press. And I heard that the German version was 800 pages down to 650 for the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or something <laughs> like that. So... It's a tome. Um, I'm sure every, it's going to be fantastic. And then also he has a book forthcoming, uh, in t which will be uh, in English, uh, called Justification and Critique in 2013, which will come out from Polity Press. He's also an editor of um, Ethics, associate editor of the journal Ethics, which you've all heard of. And he co-edits um, the series Theory und Gesellschaft. And I just heard that he was the winner of uh, the big, big prize in Germany for scholarship among all fields in 2012, the Leibniz Prize. So we congratulate you on that. It's fantastic. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm, I'll, I'll pause and introduce Adam right before his comment, which will initiate our discussion. And let me now introduce Reiner Force. Thank you so much for coming. Toleration. Thanks so much, uh, Carol, for these awfully kind words. Thanks to you and the other organizers of the seminar for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here uh, and to speak in this series. And uh, um, also, it's a, great, it's a great occasion to see a number of old friends again. So I'm very happy. Um, uh, and a number of younger colleagues uh, whose, whose work I um, I appreciate very much, and Adam Adinson is one of them, and so I'm very happy that he's going to comment on my uh, on my paper. Whether I'll be happy after his comments, I don't know, uh, but uh, for the time being, it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great pleasure. So, um, so so this works. You can hear me well, uh, and I will have to figure out how, uh, given my I, my eyes, uh, I I. Read, read this. So, so I, it'll, it, it should work. Toleration and democracy. Um, usually, we have no big problem in mentioning these two important concepts together. We do believe that in the course of the development of Western uh, democracies, uh, they appeared together. Uh, they are two important achievements uh, in the course um, of uh, the development of modern democracies. And if we are historians of ideas, we think of years like 1689, where Locke's two treatises, uh, two treatises appear and his letter concerning toleration in the same year of the Glorious Revolution and the Toleration Act of William III. If, however, we are historians of ideas, and I know some of you are of that ilk, um, we if we look a little further, uh, uh, about 100 years, um, we find that in the context of the American and the French revolutions, um, philosophers like Kant, in his famous essay on what is enlightenment, speaks of the presumptuous, the arrogant word of toleration. In the debates on the Human Rights Declaration in the uh, French National Assembly, Mirabeau um, declares that the concept of toleration smacks of tyranny. And in the rights of man, Paine says, Thomas Paine says a similar thing. 
um, and Goethe, um, some years later, um, formulates, and I quote, tolerance should be a temporary attitude only. It must lead to recognition. To tolerate means to insult, end of quote. So if we look at these reflections, it suddenly appears that toleration and democracy might not be twin sisters or brothers. They might actually be in a conflict. Uh, it might appear that uh, toleration belongs uh, to um, a darker, uh, a pre-democratic age of absolutist um, um, regimes. But on the other hand, it seems that, uh, and Carol was uh, alluding to it, uh, that in modern democracies, um, which are marked by um, um, cultural, religious, and other differences, um, we can't get by without toleration. So there seems to be a profound ambivalence about the term. There are also other open questions about toleration. One of them is where the famous limits of toleration are to lie. But the more fundamental question, of course, is what toleration actually means, why it can be maybe both an insult and a good thing to have, um, and then the question whether toleration is a good thing at all um, is something I want, to, I want to address. To show why uh, or, or how often uh, the issue of toleration comes up in current political discourse, um, let me give you some examples. And uh, for, um, to, to, to make it for you a bit more exotic, I chose, I chose German examples. Um, many of these can be transferred uh, to an American context uh, some of the peculiarities, which I won't go into here, maybe in discussion, um, might, might sound, uh, however, a bit exotic um, uh, to you. There was a big fuss in Germany about 20 years ago, uh, but it's still going on about whether um, uh, a Bavarian law that ordered uh, cr crosses or crucifixes to hang uh, on the walls of public classrooms was constitutional. Um, and the uh, German Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. Um, and then um, was uh, the reaction against it for the first time uh, was a, 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 a wild and vicious reaction um, a, against a court's decision. That was in the past unheard of. Uh, the court was denounced as being anti-religious and anti-Christian and anti-German and whatever. So. Um, in, in, this, in this debate, uh, those who were uh, arguing against that law were saying that it is intolerant uh, to have uh, the symbols of one religion and confession on the walls of public classrooms, whereas those who um, um, defended the law said it was intolerant of religion to uh, want to have the cross or the crucifix removed. In the context of the headscarf conflicts, which we have in many, uh, in many countries, and Sheila has, has, uh, um, uh, has written on this uh, both with respect to the German and the French context, in, the, in these conflicts, uh, it is often asserted that it is intolerant to prohibit, as it is in Germany, a Muslim teacher from wearing a religious headscarf. While on the other hand, uh, those who, um, who defend that ban uh, argue that indeed wearing uh, the headscarf is a sign of intolerance. So you see that in these examples, the, word of the concept of toleration is used by both, by both sides. Similar in another conflict, and I understand that in the recent, um, in the recent uh, 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 election two days, two days um, uh, ago, uh, there were some referenda on same-sex marriage uh, in Maine and Maryland, and that there's progress on that front. There is a similar debate, or has been, and still goes on in, in, in Germany, whereas um, uh, those who argue uh, for uh, same-sex marriage or a similar institution, which is not called marriage, that's uh, another issue, um, <clears throat> um, argue that it is intolerant uh, to reserve the, um, the institution of marriage uh, for uh, couples with different, uh, different sexes, whereas the uh, a conservative party had a slogan in these debates which ran um, toleration yes, marriage no. Um, so you see both sides again uh, claim uh, the concept of toleration for themselves. Uh, same in the final example, I won't bore you with these examples any longer. There is uh, there's an ongoing debate 
whether a fascist party, the National Democratic Party in Germany, should be banned. Uh, the Constitution leaves that uh, possibility. Um, it has been tried before, about 15 years ago. Uh, our friend Günther Frankenberg uh, had actually written the, uh, um, the proposal. Uh, it fell through. But the question was, should we, um, should we emphasize the limits of democratic toleration by banning that party? Or is doing so actually um, a sign of intolerance? So if we find a concept as fuzzy as this one, in so many different ways used in political discourse, we might as philosophers say, well, maybe we shouldn't use it any longer. Maybe we should just talk about what rights people have, what justice demands, what, um, um, what can be... Um, um, what, what can be done by way of an interpretation of basic, of basic rights. But maybe um, it is in, it, but it might, on the other hand, be interesting to inquire into the concept itself and its history um, and, uh, and to find out why it is such an ambivalent uh, concept. Uh, and there might be something to be learned. So let me, let me try and suggest this in a few steps. Let's first take a look at the very concept um, of toleration. I, don't be, I do believe there is a core to that concept. I'm one of the people in philosophy who defend um, uh, the, the, that, that there is a core meaning to concepts like toleration and justice, and that we do not find a rivalry of concepts. We might find a rivalry of conceptions, but not of, the, of different concepts. So the concept of toleration, and here I follow a number of other philosophers, Preston King in a, in a, in a wonderful book in the 70s, um, I think laid it out uh, nicely. The concept of toleration, I think, has three components. The first is the component of objection. If you tolerate something, and for my purposes here, I will always speak of beliefs and or practices. Um, whether we should speak of the toleration of persons, uh, I'm not so sure about. Uh, I'd be more comfortable in saying we um, tolerate something's persons believe or do, but not the person itself. Um, so the objection means um, that things you tolerate you actually find wrong, um, false, misdirected, um, ugly, bad. If you don't have an objection against what you tolerate, uh, you're not tolerant. Or you're just open to things that are different from the things you do or believe. But that's a nice thing, but it's not toleration. Also, if you're indifferent, if you have really no opinion about what the others do and no strong judgment, um, uh, you're indifferent, but not tolerant. Quite often, um, a stance of toleration is accused of indifference. But in fact, I think conceptually, that's already a mistake. Uh, Nietzsche once said toleration means the impossibility of uh, saying yes or no. Uh, you know, the wishy-washy uh, thing. You, you, you can't make up your mind. Um, that's, not, that's not toleration. There has to be a second component, which I call the component of acceptance, um, which means that apart from reasons for why you think something is wrong or misguided, you do see other reasons why it would be good or advisable, maybe even um, imperative or a duty to nevertheless tolerate it. So that's a set of positive reasons. But the positive reasons don't strike out the negative ones. If they did, it wouldn't be toleration. It would just be that you've learned something about which you had a negative opinion, but now you no longer do. So toleration means that the negative reasons and the positive reasons remain in place. Um, and so they have, to, they have to strike a balance. There's a third component, which I call the component of rejection. And it's a second negative component. This is where the so-called limits of toleration lie. So you tolerate some things you find wrong. You see reasons why it should be tolerated until a certain limit is reached, until you say this ought not to be tolerated. The part of my analysis is to show that the question of toleration really lies in the way these three components are being balanced especially in the, in the question of when an objection, uh, component one, is strong enough to, be, or to amount to a rejection of something. That's really the, the, 
uh, the consideration of toleration. It's not just what are the reasons for tolerating something, it's asking yourself, are the reasons that I have against that belief or practice good enough, sufficient, in a pluralist society to call for the rejection um, of that practice, or for banning headscarves, parties, other beliefs and practices. Now, um, so on, on that blackboard, which there, we don't have here, you find, you find uh, I, I didn't order one, so, so just imagine a blackboard. You, you find th three words so far, objection, acceptance, and rejection. If we look at these components a bit more closer, we find that they're already riddled with certain um, paradoxes. The objection component is riddled with the following uh, paradox. We could say that someone who rejects or objects to other human beings because of their race would then be all the more tolerant, the stronger this objection would be, provided that this person doesn't act on her racist beliefs, maybe for strategic reasons. But should we really call someone who is a racist and who doesn't act on his racism uh, tolerant? Um, well, um, this raises the question of the, of the criteria for what an acceptable objection actually is. Um, um, maybe we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't say that tolerance is in every case the solution to intolerance. If intolerance, if racism is a form of intolerance, and we could say that, then is tolerance the solution? Are we hoping for tolerant racists? Uh, no. We were hoping the objection would go away. They would not have that objection. So that's a long issue uh, in toleration um, uh, debates. Think of uh, the great heroes of the Enlightenment who thought that um, as long as religious differences remain, toleration will be very precarious and unstable. So they thought if people uh, think long enough about religious matters, they will come to the solution of a natural or reasonable religion, a deistic form of religion, which is actually not just allowed for, but called for by reason. So, they, so many heroes in the history of toleration were actually not arguing for toleration. They were arguing against intolerance. But what they really attacked were the objections in the first place. Uh, so that's something to keep, to keep in mind. Uh, on the other hand, if we were to raise the rationality and normative criteria for objections very high, uh, the stance of toleration would actually be rare to achieve because many people, we would, we would call for many people just to overcome their objections. Um, and when, if you think about uh, religious conflicts, deep religious, I mean, conflicts among people who deeply feel uh, that one, of, one religion is true, that their faith is true, uh, that might be too high a hurdle. The second component is riddled by the paradox um, a famous paradox much discussed in the literature of moral toleration. Say the objection to a practice is a moral objection. How can then the acceptance component uh, call upon you to morally, um, uh, if the acceptance component is also a moral component, to morally accept what you find morally wrong? Uh, that seems a clear, a clear paradox um, and it calls for uh, a closer look at the nature of objections and um, acceptance reasons. And the third uh, paradox about the third component is easy because wherever the limits of toleration will be drawn, those who happen to stand on the wrong side, namely the, sides, the side that is then called those who, are, who cannot be tolerated, the, uh, they will of course see this as an arbitrary act of exactly intolerance. So if we were to say, in a scheme of toleration, limits have to be there, but as soon as the limits are drawn, uh, it is at the same time uh, intolerance in drawing them in a certain way in place, then toleration always is its opposite. And those of you who know the work of Stanley Fish know that uh, you can have a lot of fun 
uh, with paradoxes um, like that. It all depends on what it means to draw a limit arbitrarily or not arbitrarily. So I, in the end, uh, after the two-hour talk that uh, Carol was so kind enough to uh, grant me, I'm, I'm joking. Um, uh, I come back. I try and come back to these uh, to these uh, paradoxes. I think. Uh, the uh, conceptual an analysis does show something, uh, but it doesn't give you the whole story. It does show, however, uh, that in order to fill out the components of toleration, we need additional normative resources, because these components so far are formal, empty. They don't come with values and principles. And so the analysis also shows that toleration is a normatively dependent concept. A scheme of toleration can only work if there are, there are additional values, autonomy, freedom, the word of God, uh, uh, public peace, justice, which we use to, uh, to argue um, substantively um, uh, which reasons we ought to use to fill out these, these conceptions. Toleration itself is no value. It's only a value if it's justified in the right way. There can be wrong forms of tolerance, um, um, <clears throat> and um, there can be demeaning forms of tolerance. I'll come back to that. So uh, one closer look into the history um, of toleration, which I actually did. That was a very close look into the history of toleration in this, in this book that Richard has there. And it, it, it did indeed have 800 pages, and I always apologize for it. But what can you do? I, originally, I thought um, the book should have 100 pages of the history of toleration and 100 pages uh, systematic argument and 100 pages cases and applications. So that sounded like a neat plan. But then I got into the history uh, and found, found that uh, our common way of thinking about the history of toleration is very wrong. It's very one-sided. Uh, it did not appear in modern times. Uh, it appeared much earlier. Um, and I counted uh, 25 different justifications of toleration, and they come in different historical versions. And so that's why the book uh, grew so long. Um, anyway, it'll come out in English. And uh, the translator almost killed himself over it. But it's, uh, it, didn't, it didn't happen. He's a, he's a tolerant guy. Um, <laughs> So um, looking historically, I think we can distinguish a number of conceptions of toleration in which uh, there's a bit more flesh uh, to, uh, to these components. One conception, um, uh, which is a very important one and which still holds our imagination captive, is what I call the permission uh, uh, conception. So that's the, the fourth word here on the blackboard, permission. On that conception, um, toleration means that there, there is an authority that um, grants one or several minorities the permission to live according to their beliefs and to practice their... No, no, it's all right. Uh, no, there are only five words on this blackboard, so it really doesn't... Uh, it, you know, it, you, you, you pretty much got it into you, in you, I hope. Um, while I uh, speak, you have it before you. The, um, the, there is a clear authority which grants permission uh, to minorities to live according to their uh, faith on the, on the conditions, the social conditions that the authority uh, lays out. It says, you can do this as long as you do that and not that. So the permission um, given means that all three components what's wrong about a practice, why it ought to be tolerated, and to what point are all determined by the single authority, by the permission-giving authority. It's a vertical, a hierarchical conception. And it is the one, of course, that brought toleration its bad name. Because by that, you have a structure of allowing and permitting minorities to live according to their uh, believes, but it's clear that they are second-class citizens. They are, cannot do what the others, uh, the majority in that society, uh, does and is allowed to do. Um, um, and, um, and so uh, in the many legislations of toleration, think of the toleration of Jews in medieval Christian 
um, societies, and not just medieval, but also early modern and modern societies, it was clearly laid out what they could do, when they could go to the market, which market, where, where they could live, um, uh, and, um, and so on. But think also of other famous legislations, like the Edict of Nantes of 1598, which in the opening sentences pretty clearly says, not to leave any occasion, I quote, not to leave any occasion of trouble and difference among our subjects, we have permitted and do permit to those of the reformed religion to live and dwell in all the cities and places of this our kingdom and countries under our obedience without being inquired after, vexed, molested, or compelled to do anything in religion contrary to their conscience. But of course, we have to be fair to Henri IV. Um, uh, it was a courageous thing to have this uh, edict uh, protecting uh, the Huguenots in France. If you compare it to, um, uh, um, uh, to, to what happened to the Huguenots before uh, the edict uh, and how they were persecuted and tortured and, and, um, and driven out of the country, and also soon later under Richelieu, um, and uh, uh, Louis XIV, uh, who actually revoked the edict, saying that it's no longer necessary in 1685 because there were no Huguenots left in the country, which, uh, sadly speaking, was almost true. Um, so we have to be fair. Uh, it, it is a form of disciplining a, a minority, uh, but it's also a form of liberating a minority because they have protected spaces. F to have these protected spaces, they have to be super loyal citizens to the monarch. So it's often a very strategic thing to do for the monarch. He keeps um, these citizens in the country, um, 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 and they pay with extreme loyalty. Actually, they paid with other things too, like money, uh, for this uh, protection. But on the other hand, it's a risky thing, because the monarch needs the support of the majority of his society. He cannot risk losing the support of the Catholics if you are a king in uh, 16th and 17th century France. So it's a, it's a, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult balance. Um, uh, the same structure holds for the uh, Toleration Act of 1689. It's not a happy act creating equal citizens among different religions. It is an act uh, to giving some liberties, some uh, permissions. Uh, I'm not sure we should say rights uh, because they were not rights in the sense that they were laid out uh, in a constitution. They were permissions that were granted, um, liberties that were granted um, uh, to those who did not belong to the Anglican Church. And there are many other examples uh, in the Habsburg Empire um, uh, um, where Maria uh, uh, Theresia and Joseph II, um, the end of the 18th century, shared the monarchy. Uh, and Joseph uh, thought uh, he ought to tolerate uh, the non-Catholics or some some of the more powerful non-Catholic religions. And his mother um, um, uh, wrote him very angry letters uh, saying that he is the greatest failure uh, in her life because he has no idea what the monarchy is about. The monarchy, she says, is not about uh, creating a powerful economic uh, kingdom. The monarchy is about not losing the souls of the people who live in that, uh, in, our, uh, in our empire. And you don't understand. You're, you're, you've, lost, you've lost the rationale for what we are about. It's a fascinating exchange of, uh, of letters in the time um, of, um, of, enlighten, of enlightenment. So this was an enlightened monarch. He understood that uh, his, his empire um, would not survive either uh, repressing um, the Protestant and the Orthodox um, um, believers um, or driving them out of the country. It was just too costly uh, for, um, for the empire. Now, apart from this vertical and hierarchical uh, conception, or um, after it, well, not quite after it, I shouldn't say after it, um, we, find, we find other ones, and one which I want to highlight, I call the respect conception. That also is a historical development. We find uh, arguments for it in the Netherlands, uh, in the upheaval of the Netherlands against Spanish rule in the 16th century, later in England, uh, finally in America. 
uh, and France. The idea of that conception of toleration, that it is an issue not of one majority or author author uh, authority granting certain liberties um, to second class citizen subjects, but it is a horizontal uh, conception. The citizens tolerate each other because they know that in many areas that are important for their private and social life, um, they will not come to terms. They will not agree. Uh, they will not agree on the right church. Um, but they uh, accept that they ought to agree on common terms of respecting each other um, as citizens. Um, sometimes that, that, uh, that insight comes out of struggle. And it's not a happy moral insight. It's a, it's a compromise at first. But the respect conception, um, full-blown as a democratic conception, does imply that the citizens accept that the terms on which their common and shared institutions should be justified uh, on the basis of reasons and justifications that they can equally share uh, whatever religion they have. And that's, um, um, that's a challenge. Um, um, and that is the democratic conception of toleration. I, in the end, uh, say a bit more um, about. Now, we shouldn't think that the democratic respect conception came after the permission conception, and the permission conception died out with um, the absolutist um, regimes. Because I think what we find when we look at these two conceptions of toleration, the hierarchical one and the more horizontal one, that um, in the debates I alluded to at the beginning, we find both of them. If you hold the permission conception in the crucifix case, you would say, all right, we don't force anyone uh, to pray uh, to the Christian God. Um, um, we understand that there is pluralism, so we grant uh, the right to be different uh, to others, but we will not um, yield and will not remove the symbols of the majority of the people from uh, the walls of a public classroom. Because the positive freedom, that's a nice, it, there's a nice invention in, um, in, in German constitutional law, the, the, the positive religious freedom, which is the freedom to express your beliefs, whereas the negative religious freedom is the freedom to be left alone from religious symbols and practices. Now, it's an interesting invention because the lower courts had argued that the positive freedom of the majority uh, in Bavaria calls for the expression of their religious symbols, brackets, through law in public classrooms. And that the plaintiffs who, did, who wanted to have these symbols removed were simply arguing, making a negative case. They wanted to be free from religion. So they were, the way, the, way the, the, the claims have been reconstructed was already very partial. The ones were just making a negative argument and somewhat anti-religious arguments. The, the others just wanted to express their beliefs. Um, and, uh, and also it was argued that the crucifix is not really an expression of belief, but a general symbol uh, of the of Western, uh, of Western history. So it's very difficult to argue both things at the same time, that it is an expression of the positive freedom uh, of many people and at the same time not really a religious symbol. But these, co these courts did, did make that. Uh, it, it, you know, if you, if, if you put one page between these two, these two things, you, can, you might as well say them in one and the same judgment. Um, um, and people might not, uh, might not notice. But the, the, the Constitutional Court um, did notice um, that you cannot make both claims. And the Constitutional Court then said, yes, of course it is a religious symbol. Um, and therefore, it should not be uh, on, on the walls. In the headscarf controversy, people who uh, defend the permission conception will say, of course, uh, we let everyone uh, uh, become a teacher, but the conditions under which someone can be a teacher, um, we uh, lay down. And the condition is you don't wear a headscarf. Sure, you can be a Muslim. You can be a woman, too. But you can't be a Muslim woman who wears a headscarf. So what's the problem about it? Um, for the respect conception, uh, there is a huge problem here. 
uh, because you, uh, you um, arrogate uh, the authority to determine what it actually means to wear a headscarf um, uh, while you let um, uh, people who wear crosses uh, and other symbol, religious symbols, uh, there's no problem for them to be teacher to be teachers in a German school, but if you wear a headscarf, uh, there is a problem. Um, and, um, and that is, um, um, uh, that, that's an injustice from the perspective, obviously, of the respect conception. The slogan when it came to same-sex marriage, tolerance, yes, marriage, no. We can't say that these people misunderstood what toleration means. They very well understood it. They understood what the permission conception means. It means you leave minorities or people who are different some room, but you don't give them equal rights. That's exactly what the permission conception is about. From the respect conception viewpoint, uh, that's uh, an unjustifiable thing uh, to do. It calls for equal rights, and if you deny equal rights to people, you have to have a strong argument that doesn't simply reproduce your own faith uh, why that practice should not be granted equal, um, equal rights. The problem with the fascist party is a complicated problem uh, because based on the respect conception of uh, the democratic respect conception, a party which openly aims uh, to abolish democracy cannot claim a right to be tolerated in that way. Um, here, the friends of the permission conception have an easier case. They say, all right, maybe we shouldn't tolerate them. But maybe for strategic reasons, it's better to have this party tolerated than to have it go underground. We can much better um, oversee what they do uh, and have our informants if they are a political party than they are, if they are an underground uh, party. A actually, the informant issue was the one that did explode um, 15 or 20 years ago, the, uh, the ban uh, proposal, because uh, what our friends who wrote up the ban um, didn't know was that many of the quotations from the party representatives uh, about their aims of that party were actually quotations from people who the um, Verfassungsschutz, how do you call that? Um, the constitu the the, um, the 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 well the the secret police who protects the uh, the constitution. These were people who had been paid by the uh, secret uh, uh, police. Were on the payroll, so they were informants. So uh, so the, the whole crafted 200-page proposal uh, showing what this party was about did have a number of quotations uh, from people who the Verfassungsschutz had, been, had sent there, so it exploded, so you couldn't. And the, the fascist party had a great time um, um, when this, uh, when, when this um, uh, happened. But uh, uh, before we say then uh, that in these cases the respect conception actually falls back into the permission conception, we should be uh, we should be careful. It's not the same thing if you have a permission conception where the authority arbitrarily decides who can be tolerated, or if you have a permission conception where the principle tells you there's not a right to be tolerated, but there might be additional good reasons for tolerating uh, an intolerant and anti-democratic uh, party. So it's not that I think the respect conception falls back um, into the... Um, into the permission uh, conception. <clears throat> now, what I haven't said much about um, is the justification for the respect conception. What's the notion of respect that is central here? Uh, and I have to speed up a little, so um, I will uh, not go into length at length why classical arguments for respecting um, practices and beliefs of others don't quite work. Think of the classical argument about freedom of conscience. That's surely one of the most important arguments. It's a very old one. We find it in antiquity. We find it in Augustine and many others before Locke. Um, it, was, it was argued that uh, it was a twofold argument. First, conscience cannot be forced. And second, it must not be. 
It cannot be because conscience is an autonomous thing. Uh, you cannot force someone to believe something he or she does not believe in. Uh, conscience is not the kind of individual uh, uh, um, cognitive entity that reacts to force. Now, already Augustine, and uh, for those of you who looked into the history of toleration, you've probably come across uh, Proast, Jonas Proast, the Anglican uh, priest who wrote the letters against John Locke's letters, which made Locke produce three more letters concerning toleration, which always re reacted to letters Proast had written. But in the end, uh, Locke died over the fourth letter. Um, and uh, Proast had made a simple argument that Augustine had already made. Augustine had argued, yeah, I believe that too, that conscience cannot be the object of force. But um, the experiences with the Donatists um, uh, and what the church did to them and how many Donatists wrote Augustine uh, letters thanking the church for pushing them out of their wrong ways and for opening their eyes. Augustine says, yes, it is true that we cannot force the right insight into people, but we can use force to liberate them from their false beliefs. And then there is a, a limbo. Uh, and then the right teaching will give them the right direction. So force has a, has a wonderful negative effect. It shakes people loose from uh, their false beliefs. And Augustine said terror is uh, a wonderful means um, for that. And Proas says you lay bricks and thorns on the false ways. People will then have to turn, and then you teach them the right thing and the love of God. So uh, that conscience cannot be forced, and we have many more modern examples, I think, uh, where we can see that you can do a lot uh, in terms of directing consciences is, is probably not a valid argument, a valid empirical argument. So why would conscience, why did people think conscience must not be forced? Well, the argument was, and it's also one we already find in Augustine, but there was a, there was a medieval um, Augustinian called Luther who made a lot out of it. Um, conscience is the place in uh, our soul where we stand before God. It is, as Luther said, uh, the property of God. It's not our property, our conscience. It's the work of God in us. And so we must not force it, because then we encroach upon God's prerogative. It is God who uh, interacts with our conscience and not human beings. Now this uh, famous argument uh, we find in Locke, and that's also the argument where, which made Locke say that uh, Catholics should not be tolerated because they don't have a conscience of that kind, because they're willing to bind their conscience to an inner worldly sovereign, which is what people who have the proper conscience don't do. Um, and atheists, of course, don't have a conscience in the first place. Um, so why should they be? Um, why should they be tolerated? Uh, there are many modern um, variants of the argument for liberty of conscience. One of them is the post-million argument that people should be the autonomous authorities to uh, decide about their good life. Um, they should be creators um, of the good life. Only the good life lived from, with, from the inside, as Nozick once said, uh, can be the good can be the good life. So it's, a, it's an ethical argument. It's an argument about the good life, which serves then uh, for, um, uh, uh, as the core of the toleration argument. We find it in Will Kimlicka and many others. Now, uh, that's also a questionable argument. And my old friend Augustine would have said, how do you know uh, that the autonomously chosen, and Augustine would have added, what actually does it mean to autonomously choose your way of life? Whoever did that? Um, um, uh, um, who, who are you to know that the autonomously chosen um, a good conception of the good is a precondition for living a good life? I can imagine people who have not chosen their notions of the good life and who lead a good life, subjectively as well as objectively. So the argument, um, um, what a precondition for the good life is, I think is a shaky thing. It's itself a conception of the good which is reasonably disputable. It is not 
um, um, it, is, it is not a truth about ourselves, which we can be as uh, sure of as about um, other things. So, in brief, the respect conception of toleration for that, um, and I come to a close, um, I have another hero in the, in the history of toleration, and it is Pierre Bale, a Huguenot philosopher, a wonderful um, uh, philosopher. He, he argued a number of courageous things, such as uh, the thought experiment in a wonderful book, um, the thought experiment, what would it mean for a society of atheists to exist? Would that be a possibility? In the 17th century, that's, that's an unusual argument to make, and he was uh, arguing that it could potentially be much more peaceful than a religious society because many reasons of conflict would not exist um, in that society. He has a long treatise on toleration in which he argues essentially that if in a, in a conflict, in a religious conflict, each party claims the truth or the authority to determine the common arrangement of life, the norms they all have to live under, to determine this on the basis of their own religious beliefs, it will never happen. Because then each party just claims its beliefs to be the truth. Um, so they have to find a justification on a different level. They have to find justifications for the norms they all live under, which do not reproduce the religion of A or B. There has to be a principle of justification to all equally produce the justifications for the norms they are to accept. But that has, and, and that principle, to respect others as equal justificatory authorities, that principle Bale thought was a principle of practical reason. So he was a proto-Kantian. Why did he think it was a principle of practical reason? He said, look at the religious conflicts of our time. Do you notice that whenever someone arrogates the authority to determine what this society, how this society should um, develop and puts in his or her own beliefs that it always reproduces um, um, partiality. If you see, see that, what is it that makes you see that? It is an insight into the possibility of an impartial argument. And so isn't practical reason the capacity to at least seek impartial arguments when you see that uh, the warring factions just reproduce uh, their own beliefs, the truth of which is just what the dispute is about. Then people said, okay, Bale must be a skeptic, because for that argument to accept, you have to give up the idea that your religion is true, don't you? And many people read Bale in that way, but they misread him. Bale didn't, was not a skeptic. He did not say there is no truth in religion. He said, yes, there is truth in religion, but it is religious truth. It is truth that you affirm on the basis of faith, not on the basis of knowledge. So did he say religion was against reason? No, he said it is beyond reason. He said it is dessus de la raison. Religion answers metaphysical questions that reason allows for and that reason alone cannot answer. Why there's evil in the world, Bale says. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, religions have something to say about. But whether you believe in original sin is a matter of faith, not a matter of what re reason demands. Does reason allow for it? They said, yes, it allows for it because reason understands where its limits lie in giving a metaphysical answer to a metaphysical question. So it, uh, it rules out certain uh, answers, but not all answers. It leaves, it leaves it open. Bale also believed that reason is the capacity for people to understand where the limits of reason lie and where the proper realm of religion begins. So he's not a skeptic. He's a half skeptic. He believes that knowledge and reason do not tell us the truth about religion. Faith might tell us the truth about religion, but then we have to know as reasonable persons that it is 
truths on the basis of faith. So those who have faith shouldn't, uh, shouldn't arrogate uh, the, uh, the uh, authority to determine uh, what, how a society uh, ought to be structured for themselves on the basis of their, um, of their faith. And those who have no faith shouldn't arrogate the authority to say that those who have faith are irrational, because they are not. Sometimes they're irrational, like when they mix up um, uh, natural reason um, with uh, their religion, and they believe the appearance of a comet um, um, is a sign of God. That, uh, um, Bale said, if, if you have science that tells you what happened there, um, um, uh, there's, no, there's, there's no good reason to say that it was a sign sent by God, but for many other metaphysical uh, reasons, there is, there is um, room for speculation and for difference. So Bale wasn't the first to come up with the idea of what Rawls later called reasonable disagreement. It is precisely the disagreement in religious matters where we disagree about what the truth, about the good life, the soul, or whatever is, and reason frames these debates. But reason cannot answer these questions with its own power. It has to accept its own finitude. So there is a, there's a realm of reasonable disagreement where uh, people think the others are wrong, but not unreasonable in giving a religious answer to a metaphysical, to a metaphysical question. And in the course of, of that book, I came across a number of people who uh, had similar ideas uh, earlier than, uh, than Bale. Baudin, for example, in a wonderful uh, book he wrote, um, as a, a, it's a dialogue between s seven different religions, um, wrote it in the end of the 16th, uh, 16th century. And these defenders of different religions, for an endless book, um, um, dispute all kinds of religious questions. And the old form of religious dialogues in the Middle Ages were always that the Christian would win. Uh, if it goes well, the, the, the Jew remains in the dialogue until the end. But in many Christian dialogues, he falls out earlier. And, and it's clear that you know this is an un unbelievable thing to hold. And then there are others who fare a little better. With, with Baudin, it's different. Until the end, everyone has, in principle, the power to refute rationally what the others say. And in the end, they say, oh, my friends, uh, we have to come to the conclusion that our powers of reason are enough to say what we find wrong about the others' belief, but they are not sufficient to say who is right here. So they, they part and decide from now on no longer to discuss religion, but uh, respect each other as reasonable beings. Many people, many philosophers believe that the notion of reasonable disagreement doesn't make sense. If you believe in the truth of something, you will not believe that others who don't believe that truth are reasonable. And I think that's a major mistake. You don't understand the epistemic register of religion if you hold that, um, 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 that consideration. And, and, and I was very happy to, to see that Rawls in his, in his uh, uh, late uh, statement about his religion actually refers to Baudin uh, and that text of Baudin uh, uh, when, he, uh, when he explains the notion of reasonable disagreement. And had he known Bale, or had I known Bale when I knew Rawls, uh, he would have been very happy uh, to uh, find a Rawlsian in the early 17th century. Now, um, the paradoxes I, I should leave here, uh, you probably have a hint now uh, at how they um, uh, can be um, resolved. Um, the tolerant racist I already spoke about. Um, tolerance is not always the right reaction to um, intolerance. The paradox of moral tolerance, how can it be morally right to tolerate what is morally wrong, has to be differentiated. The objection reasons, if the objection reasons are strong moral reasons, it cannot be morally right to respect what is morally wrong. Uh, the reasons for objection have to be of a different kind than the reasons of acceptance and, um, and rejection. And the drawing of limits, yes. If in the realm of drawing these limits, we have no way to distinguish an arbitrary drawing from a non-arbitrary one, that paradox cannot be resolved. And in that case, indeed, 
toleration remains a completely partial principle in the Schmidian fight between friend and foe. It just depends on where you stand, what you think, where the limits are. But for a Balian, that is uh, an unreasonable stance. For a Balian, in the realm of reasons, there is the possibility of drawing the limits. Maybe you may be wrong in where you draw them because you're a finite being, but in principle, um, the principle of impartial justification or reciprocal justification should uh, guide you when you think you are justified in drawing the limit of toleration. I'm, I'm sorry for going on for that long. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was stimulating and provocative, and hopefully you're gathering your questions. Um, to facilitate our discussion, I think we should move now, Adam, is that okay, to your comment? And then we'll take a short break and have the, um, unless you're really exhausted from the heat. No, you're okay. Okay, so I'd like to introduce um, our, our very own Adam Ettenson, who is our postdoctoral fellow under the Mellon Sawyer um, grant that we have. And he's here uh, for the year, and we picked him out of uh, 100 applicants, so he clearly rose to the top. Um, he received his DPhil degree in philosophy from Oxford in 2011, uh, working with especially Jeremy Waldron, as well as John Tassoulis and Roger Crisp. His thesis was entitled Human Rights and the Problem of Ethnocentrism, and he defended an epistemological interpretation of the problem of ethnocentrism and suggested two limited respects in which ethnocentrism can be avoided in moral argument. He works now um, also very much in the philosophy of human rights and has research interests in related areas of moral and political philosophy, including theories of liberalism, toleration, cosmopolitanism, and moral epistemology. Uh, last year, Adam was a research um, postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Ethics at the University of Mo Montreal. Um, he has a couple of articles. I'll just mention... Um, Titles. One is Aboriginal Oral History, Evidence, and Canadian Law. A second one is on Cosmopolitanism, Cultural, Moral, and Political. And a recent one is Political and Naturalistic Conceptions of Human Rights, a False Polemic, question um, mark. And he's working on, a, on an edited book um, on human rights, moral or political. So he's perfectly um, ready and by his background to comment on this paper. Adam, please. Thank you for coming. OK. Um, so thanks for having me. And it's a real honor to be commenting uh, on such a great presentation uh, by such a wonderful scholar, and especially one that fits in so well with the Mellon Sawyer seminar theme, which is of course, democratic citizenship and the recognition of cultural differences, uh, for which toleration is a very important concept. Um, so I'll try and be uh, as quick as I can, because um, I know you, know you probably want to take a, a bit of a break before discussions come. Uh, so Professor Forst, he invites us to think uh, pretty carefully about the concept of toleration, and specifically about the various different practices and ideals which often get jumbled together under that heading. And he wants us to, to draw some careful distinctions. And he thinks we can do two important things if we draw uh, such distinctions. So one, it's going to help us resolve certain conceptual paradoxes which he, which he referred to. So for instance, the paradox of the tolerant racist, which he mentioned, the idea that I can become more tolerant if I become more racist uh, by as long as I don't interfere with those who uh, those persons who I, I object to on the basis of, of their race, which sounds a bit strange, obviously. Um, and other paradoxes like that of drawing the limits of toleration. So every time I draw the limits uh, to, uh, to what I'm going to tolerate, those who I no longer tolerate are going to see those limits as themselves arbitrary and, and intolerant. So is there any non-arbitrary way to set these limits so we can arbitrate those? those disagreements. Um, so that's one thing it, these distinctions are going to help us do. And then another is that they'll help us analyze and decide certain very hard cases, uh, which 
Professor Forrest mentioned, such as the crucifix decision. You know, what does toleration have to say about crucifixes in public schools? Uh, what does it have to say about uh, Muslim female teachers wearing headscarves in public schools? And what does it have to say about the democratic exclusion of parties like the, BN, uh, the NDP in Germany or the BNP uh, in the UK? Um, so if we draw these distinctions, we're going to be able to help analyze. We're going to be able to analyze and solve these, these hard cases. So what he suggests in particular is that we draw a distinction between what I thought was an older kind of permission conception of toleration uh, and a newer one, a uh, respect-based version. But he, he doesn't seem to go for the timeline. Uh, anyways, that's, that's OK. So unlike the permission-based uh, conception of toleration where you have a political authority, whether it's a monarchy or it's a um, democratic majority, um, granting permission to some minority which it deems wayward or objectionable to nevertheless continue with its, uh, with its deplorable or objectionable practices. Um, the respect-based toleration is different. It's a horizontal conception rather than what he calls a vertical or hierarchical uh, conception. And what it involves is citizens essentially taking an attitude of respect towards one another as the equal holders of political power. So there's not a single higher political power granting permission, but citizens as equal arbiters uh, and holders of political power um, taking an attitude of respect towards one another. Um, so in this way, it involves uh, granting all citizens equal rights that can be accepted by or justified to all. Uh, that's the basic distinction uh, that he wants to draw. And it's here that the idea of democracy or the theme of democracy comes into the mix because um, according to Professor Force, it's only the respect-based conception of toleration that captures the idea of toleration latent in uh, the theory and practice of democracy. Um, so to the extent that toleration is seen as a kind of non-democratic practice or value, or at least one that's in tension uh, with democracy, that's because it's entangled with this old permission-based uh, conception. Um, so the old kind of objections that you get to toleration from Goethe and, and Mirabeau um, and Thomas Paine, which Professor Forrest brought up, the idea that toleration smacks of tyranny or that it's a form of insult, those objections really only stick to this permission-based conception, or at least they, they're mainly directed at that. And this respect-based conception, this alternative is supposed to be able to escape um, those objections and, and uh, be a better alternative in that respect. So that's one of the benefits of the, of the respect-based uh, conception of toleration, that it's able to evade uh, these old um, objections that you know, were formerly developed by Goethe and Mirabeau and, and Thomas Paine, and maybe more recently by people like Wendy Brown, um, who have similar objections of toleration as a kind of demeaning practice. So at least the, the respect-based conception mitigates those objections. And how does it do that? Well, um, instead of, instead of uh, toleration being this morally and political politically hierarchical concept. Instead, you have um, a conception where all citizens are seen as equal members of the, of the moral political community. So they're seen as the equal holders of power. Um, the limits of toleration aren't set by the views, the ethical views of the majority, but are rather determined on the basis of shareable and reciprocal reasons that can be justified to all and that are not controversial in a democratic society. So ideas like basic rights, democratic uh, respect, the right to justification. And of course, because the respect-based version requires a neutral public culture, uh, which wouldn't stigmatize or exclude minorities as second-class citizens um, for their differences. So in these ways, uh, Professor Force's conception of democracy is an improvement on on the permission-based uh, version of toleration, or at least it tries to make toleration a more modern concept, or at least more viable in, uh, in, the modern, in modern contexts. 
Um, but it doesn't go quite as far as, let's say, recognition-based theories of, of toleration have. So you could see people like uh, Anna Elisabetta Galeotti who've, who've said that uh, toleration should really become about recognition, so something like the celebration of the equal value of different cultures as answering these old objections. Um, they're trying to resuscitate the conception, the, the, the idea of toleration uh, in maybe a more dramatic way. And I think it's good that uh, Professor Force doesn't go quite that far, um, because I think once you turn toleration into a matter of celebrating the equal value of all cultures, uh, the equal value of different beliefs and practices, you start to lose hold of uh, what makes toleration um, toleration, which is that there's something you're objecting to um, initially. Um, so I think you start to stretch the concept beyond a reasonable limit if you go, or at least you start to muddy the concept if you turn toleration into a form of acceptance. It might be a good thing, as Professor Force said, but it doesn't sound like toleration anymore, at least it's problematically uh, a form of toleration. So I think it's good that he doesn't go that far. Um, and I also think it's uh, Professor Ford's right to emphasize the power of fallibilism um, as, you know, or doctrines that attest to what he calls the finitude of reason um, and its inability to generate absolutely certain conclusions on moral and theoretical matters and the resulting inevitability of something like uh, reasonable disagreement as an important element in the case for toleration. So if I can't be absolutely certain that my moral and theological convictions are correct, uh, then this gives me less reason to try to impose uh, those views on you. Um, and it also gives me reason to actually hear what you have to say and potentially learn from what you think um, on these matters rather than, say, imprisoning you, um, of course. So that's a sort of fallibilistic argument you get in Mill and that you get in Bale to some extent, I think, as well. At least. I, I feel yeah. <laughs> when I read Bale, at least I felt right, that, that it was there. Uh, you get it in Popper, and you do get it to some extent in Rawls in his own way. And I think it's, I think uh, Professor Force is right to kind of draw on that very venerable argument um, in, in historical discussions and contemporary discussions of toleration. And I also think he's right to emphasize the role of something like what he calls a right to justification in modern democratic theory. Um, so I think it does seem to be part of the very idea of a liberal democratic order that the use of political power be justifiable or acceptable to all citizens, uh, regardless of the fact that they disagree. They hold different views on what's good and what God uh, exists and what kinds of, of gods exist. Um, and, you know, there is this idea that some effort must be made uh, in a liberal democracy to make the political order justifiable to all citizens despite this fact, so, so to find some common ground. And insofar as Professor Force's conception of toleration captures that idea, um, I think it does capture something central to modern democratic theory and practice. So I just want to end by raising some questions about... Um, Professor Force's account. So one of the things he says is that um, with his uh, respect-based conception of, of toleration, we can tackle this paradox of the limits of toleration. So every time I impose a limit to what I can tolerate, that limit's going to look arbitrary from the point of view of those I no longer tolerate. And so we have a question about whether we can set a non-arbitrary uh, limit here. And his way of answering the question of why, say, the NDP in, in Germany, a far-right party, I can't complain about the states not tolerating, tolerating their, their party platform, is that the NDP itself infringes on this set of shareable and reciprocal values that are non-controversial in a democratic society. So things like basic civil rights, um, democratic respect, uh, the right to justification itself. So in other words, um, as long as we let basic democratic values dictate the limits of toleration, um, then we can avoid uh, toleration. As long as we let 
As long as we only prohibit beliefs and practices that conflict with these basic democratic values, um, then the limit that we set to toleration in so doing won't be arbitrary or question begging. So the question that I have is how that works exactly. How does that argument work? So how exactly does uh, Professor Forrest generate that conclusion? So I'm sure he has more to say about it than he's told us here. Obviously, he has this several books uh, coming out, one of them 650 pages, some sir. Somewhere in there, uh, the argument uh, is, 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 split, is um, put out. Um, but all we know at this point is that things like basic civil rights and the rights to justification uh, and democratic respect, these values are values that are practiced in a democratic society. That's, that's pretty much all he's told us about these things, and which are to set the limits of toleration. And so we don't know anything yet about their validity. We haven't been told anything about their validity, nor do we know enough about these values to be able to deem them incontrovertible, uh, not subject to reasonable disagreement, or objectively binding, or true, or non-arbitrary. So in order to get that far, we would need to hear arguments that explain why these values have the compelling sort of authority that uh, you say they do. And this isn't to say that such arguments you know, can't be made. Um, but that we just don't know what they are yet, and that it's important that we do, because otherwise the paradox just comes in. Back again, we don't know why these are not uh, arbitrary uh, limits that you're setting. So that's one thing, and it also opens up to a larger, kind of more general, and a little slightly more subtle problem, or set of problems. So I think there's a danger in the recent tendency in liberal theory to stop asking questions about the justification of basic liberal values and instead to just start with the idea of reasonable persons um, who endorse these values and then to work up a theory of, of justice or of toleration from there. And I think the danger in doing that, um, and of course Rawls is one very good example of this, um, is the promotion of a kind of blind acceptance or affirmation of the self-evidence uh, and non-controversial nature of liberal values. So what's really so dangerous about that, you might say, because these seem like quite self-evident uh, norms. Well, um, for one, as I said, it impairs our ability to do something like answer the paradox of the limits of toleration, right? Because we can't explain why um, the structured use of political power in uh, a liberal democracy against things that a liberal democracy will typically deem uh, intolerable, racist, sexist, um, xenophobes, uh, murderers. Um, why is that not arbitrary? Why is that use of power not arbitrary? We, if we can't answer the question of the, the paradox of, of the limits, then we can't tell us that ourselves why these are not arbitrary uses of political power unless we ask for, unless we somehow look for a justification of, of these values. Um, so that's one problem, which I've already mentioned. But secondly, I think it impedes our ability to at least even minimally respect those who we deem illiberal. Like, for instance, those who are less convinced of the superiority of, say, a secular liberal political order and maybe prefer a theocratic alternative or something like that. Um, and why does it leave us unable to uh, minimally respect them? Well, because it leaves us unable to do them the duty of at least explaining why we think they're wrong, especially if they live in our midst, uh, because we don't know why, because we haven't answered um, uh, the question for ourselves. So we can't explain to the unconverted why we think they're wrong. Um, and also, I think we become locked into the conviction that we actually don't need to explain to e-liberals why um, they're wrong at all. In fact, they don't deserve such an explanation, and we don't need to hear what they have to say about the matter because actually there's something wrong with them. They just don't get it. Uh, they're crazy. They haven't grasped something that's self-evident to, to everyone else. Um, and, you know, I can understand why you might, why we all might want to adopt that sort of attitude towards a party like the NDP or the BNP uh, in the UK, horrible uh, political parties. But um, 
I think to do so is nevertheless a form of disrespect um, and would be a way of stooping to their level in, in a certain sense. Maybe not quite to their level, but, uh, but it would be a form of disrespect uh, nonetheless. And lastly, I'll just end here. I think this kind of axiomatic theoretical presumption of liberal democratic values that you get uh, very often um, in, in uh, recent liberal theory uh, leads us to forget how deeply ambiguous and indeterminate these values are. So there's so much room even within uh, this horizon of assumptions, democratic respect, uh, the right to justification, uh, basic civil rights. Uh, what do those really mean? There's so much controversy about what those norms and, and values and principles really mean um, that they're not in themselves going to clearly tell us what to do about, even among them, some of the cases that I think you've mentioned. And it, apart from them, a host of basic and important issues. So for instance, they don't tell us anything about the moral status of fetuses. And so uh, whether abortion is acceptable or whether it's not acceptable, they don't tell us how to balance the value of social inclusion against the value of free speech, how we can arbitrate conflicts of that sort. They don't tell us how or whether to allow parties like the BNP or, or the NDP to participate and be included in our political processes. In order to get those conclusions, to sort out those cases, you need a vast amount of interpretive argument. You need empirical uh, work. And the values themselves aren't going to give you um, the answer. So to, to invoke them as the ultimate arbitrators of these hard cases in, in toleration uh, seems to really raise more questions than it answers. And I think what we would need to do, it seems to me, if you wanted to answer more questions than you'd raise, is to say or give a little bit more of a detailed explanation about how your maybe special interpretation of the liberal tradition of these, these values, which have been such a bulwark of the liberal tradition for so long, how it helps us navigate um, these issues. And again, I don't want to presume that you haven't done that, because you very well may have, but it seems important. So that's it. Thank you very much.